Welcome to worship. We are so glad that you have joined us this week as we have gathered together as the people of God, as the body of Christ to worship together. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to do this, to be together, even though we have been apart for these months, but we're glad that you have joined us this morning for worship. We continue in the sermon series on Technicolor Joy, looking this morning specifically at this great hymn in Philippians 2, looking at joy and humility as we look at the life of Jesus. Um, but as we, before we get started, just some announcements for us. Um, our next tailgate party is going to be July 11th at 6.30 in the parking lot here at church. Bring some food and something to drink and a seat, a seat to sit on and join us for some fellowship out in front of church. Young Adult Worship continues on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here in the building um, for a time of fellowship and reflection and looking at the scriptures. Um, if you have not yet um, called myself or even Matt and Katrin Beatty about their move on July 4th, make sure you do that so they have lots of hands helping them move across town. Um, we are so glad, too, for the wonderful sacrificial giving that many of you have done during this time when we have been apart. It's a joy to me and a blessing to me to um, see how you have been giving to this ongoing work of hope, even though we have been apart. Um, and if you're looking for a place to serve, as that's something we're talking about this morning, know that Barnabas and the teams of Barnabas are looking for new people to join them, to help them in the many ways that they serve people in our congregation, um, many times and in many ways. So we are thankful for them. And if you'd like to join them, give Robert Hughes or myself a call. As we gather for worship, hear these words that this is the day to let your heart take control of your lips. We can't keep silent. Our hearts are bursting with praise for Jesus, who is king of our lives. In spite of the shadow of the cross, Jesus comes into our hearts as we surrender our lives to him. So let's today, this day, commit ourselves wholly to Jesus and ask him to be present in our lives always. Let us pray. Our Lord God, whose son followed your will both as servant and savior, and now who rules in the hearts of those who accept him as king, we pray that you would open our hearts to his rule, that as we listen to the music and rejoice in what we hear, that as we open your word and the blessings of those words fill our hearts, may we share our lives and with those around us that people would know that in our lives, Jesus is king. Amen.
Over the last few weeks, the U.S. has been grappling with monuments and statues and what to do with them, as they have been historically, many of them tied to racism, especially as they relate to events and persons who fought on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War. But Canada, it seems, has similar problems, statues that glorify colonialism and its erasure of Canadians' indigenous heritage have also been problematic for years. Statues of people like British General 
um, Edward Cornwallis and John McDonald, who are part of the formation of Canada, but were responsible for laws that forced indigenous people to assimilate to white culture and forced indigenous children to be sent to residential schools. Such monuments and statues are, are not modern day um, occurrences. For thousands of years, cultures have, have created monuments to celebrate famous personages and military events or even gods who were revered for who they were and what they had done. These statues and monuments are, are statements of pride in a person's achievement or because they had achieved some heroic status and they were worthy of imitation. In Paul's day, there were men like Alexander the Great and his father, Philip II, for whom the, the city of Philippi was named, were considered gods. Monuments were built to their honor, statues and sculptures were carved to display their greatness, and coins were minted with their faces upon them so that all who looked on their faces would remember who they were and what they had accomplished. The good news that Paul preached to the Philippians would have sounded strange to a people who revered and worshiped Alexander and his father, Philip, who had temples given to the worship of the emperor Caesar and, and, and to emperor Nero and who ruled over the entire Roman Empire, an empire that now imprisoned Paul. For the man at the center of Paul's good news was someone who was humiliated and beaten and died a traitor's death on a cross, the Roman instrument of death. Such a man dying such a death would have offended the Philippians' understanding of greatness and heroic achievement. And yet Paul, as he writes this letter to the Philippian church, he tells them that they were to be like-minded, that they were to have the same love, the same spirit, the same mind, and the same attitude as Christ Jesus. And to illustrate Jesus' attitude of mind, Paul writes this beautiful hymn of praise that focused not on a statue or a carving or a coin to honor a conquering hero. Instead, Paul's words express the honest joy that he experiences when he thinks about Jesus, the very Son of God, who is also the servant of all. Before we look at this, mom this morning's passage, remember that last week Paul wrote the key, that the key to joy for us as followers of Christ is to live a life that reflects Christ in all of our relationships. That such a life is costly because it requires that we put aside our pride, that we put aside our selfish desires, and it requires that we think of others as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I remember once after one of the snowstorms of this past winter on a cold but sunny day, I decided it was a great time to take a walk. So I got my dog and, and we set out to the canal by my house. After I stepped off the walking path, it was clear that it probably would have been smart to bring my snowshoes because the snow was deep and it was going to take some effort to continue to walk forward. But as I walked, I noticed that someone else had been there before me and I knew that if I was going to, to find my way along this uh, kind of big uh, path of grass that now covered with snow, very deep snow, that I needed to walk in their footsteps. Now, that didn't make the walking any easier because that those foot friends were farther apart than my normal walking gait. So I took it slow and I put my feet in the tracks and I made my way through. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus is also not easy. It might seem at times that Jesus' footsteps are too big for us to walk in. 
that we will exhaust ourselves in the effort to do as Paul talks about in these, in these verses, to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. But if we are thoughtful and take our time and, and pray and, and give ourselves over to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, we will be able to walk the way that has been marked for us by the footsteps of Jesus. All we have to do is follow where Jesus has walked. The first step that we take is the first verse of our passage this morning, the step of self-denial. Paul tells us this. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what. The footsteps of Jesus are hard to walk in because our culture welcomes self-promotion and encourages our need to promote our rights above the rights of others. It doesn't matter if what I want puts you at a disadvantage because my needs, my wants, my rights are the only things that count. Jesus never lived like that. He set aside his heavenly glory glory, and lived a poured out life, a life of humility and selflessness. He didn't live to bring glory and attention to himself, but he gave glory to his heavenly father who sent him. And even his death was selfless. He was God, the very son of God, and he could have called all of the angels out of heaven to come and take him off the cross but he instead willingly set his life aside for the sake of the world. To follow in Jesus' footsteps is to live such a poured out life, to relinquish our desire for self-promotion, to relinquish our rights, which is not easy to do in a social media age when we feel entitled to believe we have the right to be noticed to be the center of attention, to promote ourselves. How Jesus lived reminds us that real life, real joy, comes when we give up our rights, our advantages, our status, our need to be noticed, and to pour out our life for others. Jesus said, whoever wants to be great must become a servant. And whoever wants to be the first must become the slave of all. Jesus poured out his life for us, for the world. And we are called to set aside ourself and pour out our lives for others in the same way. The second step that Jesus takes is about identification. <clears throat> when the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. When the time came for Jesus to, to be among us, he became a servant. He poured out his life for others. And if we are to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we are to do the same thing. When I walked in the footsteps of the person who had walked before me on that snowy day when I took a walk with my dog, I had to follow in the exact pattern that he had walked in so that I didn't seek into the deep snow around those footsteps. I needed to identify with his footsteps if I was to keep going meant I had to walk slower, I had to take my time and watch where I put my feet. Jesus didn't just say he knew about others' experiences, he actually walked in their shoes. Jesus had no home, no job. He touched lepers and met with people who were possessed by demons. He talked with children and women, and he ate at the home of sinners, 
Jesus identified with those he loved and lived with and died for. He walked in their shoes and he knew their life. Jesus walked in our footsteps. He understands our human frailty. He knows our temptations. He suffers with us. And he gave up his life to end sin's hold in our life. And Jesus calls us as his followers who are walking in his footsteps, who are to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, to serve others in the same way, to identify with their hurts and others' disappointments and and others' pain so that we can walk in their footsteps and be a companion with them on life's journey. The next step we are to follow is one of obedience. Paul goes on to say that Jesus lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. In the Bible, the word for obedience means to hear. So someone is obedient is also a good listener. I had a dog named Curry, who was a wonderful dog, but her obedience left something to be desired. If she was off leash and we entered an area where there are lots of distractions and I saw there was kind of danger around, I would call her to come back so I could hook her up to the leash and we could be safe. But I could see that when I called her, she would turn to look at me and I, as if I could see the wheels in her head turning, whether to see if it was of her benefit to come back to me or to keep running around and enjoying the life that she was having. Curry's behavior is very instructive because I know that that's how I am when it comes to obedience to God and earlier in my life to my parents. When I was little, my mom told me that I would often throw my food off of my high chair onto the floor. And she would tell me to stop. And she said I would take the food up in my little hand, look her right in the eyes, and took my hand and dropped it on the floor. Obedience, it seems, is hard for me, even as a child and even now as an adult. You see, whether it's my dog's behavior or my own, and whether we are young or whether we are old, obedience is about making a decision to listen to the voice of the one who is giving instruction. And conversely, disobedience is consciously making a choice not to hear what we are being told to do. Jesus was in constant communion with his father in prayer. He was always obedient to the will of his father. But on the night when, before he was to be killed, he goes again to his father in prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, and he prays this kind of almost desperate prayer where he is sweating blood and, um, and he is in agony about what is to come and as if he's praying that God would have a plan B. But as he listens and communes with his father and listens to his father's voice, he knows that his only course is obedience. And he says, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me but yet not as I will, but as you will. Obedience. Jesus was obedience to the will of his father. We also wrestle often with obedience because it calls us to do our father's will as well, to give up our desires, our our pursuits, and place our lives in the hand of the one who created us and knows us so well. Only when we are willing to die to our wills can Jesus help us to listen and to be obedient. The next step is continued from the verse we just read and that obedience that Jesus has was to the worst kind of that death, a crucifixion. Step four is about sacrifice. Last fall, when I walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain with my sister, it was an amazing trip. 
We saw beautiful scenery and ate delicious food and the achievement of walking farther than I had ever walked before. But such an achievement came at a price. It came with some sacrifice. It took some time and training to make sure that I was ready to walk as much as I were, we were going to walk every day. But after the first day when the blisters appeared, I recognized that pain was also going to be part of this journey. We taped up my feet, and every day when I put my shoes on and took that first step of the day, I knew that it was going to be a, a hard day, but I sacrificed comfort to complete the journey so that when I arrived at our designation in Santiago, I knew that every single sacrifice I had made to get there was worth every painful step. As followers of Jesus, we are also called to walk in his footsteps and make sacrifices as well. Now, we are probably are never in our lifetime going to be asked to, to die for our faith, but we are called to sacrifice our plans, our habits and desires, our relationships for the sake of Christ. For Roman citizens like the Philippians, the degrading character of the cross might have been an offense, a, a stumbling block to faith. But Paul saw the cross as a symbol of love and forgiveness and sacrifice. In the Gospel of John, we read, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Charles Wesley, in his great hymn, writes these words, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me. Jesus willingly sacrificed his life, willingly died a painful and humiliating death, all for us, all for the love of us. And finally, Paul wraps up this, this hymn of praise with these words. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. If we follow in Christ's footsteps, we will deny ourselves and identify with those we serve to hear and obey God's voice, to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of Christ, and then to give praise for who Jesus is and what he has done in our lives. Following in the footsteps of Jesus, we will slowly, over time, have that same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Now, we might never have a monument created in our honor or have a coin minted with our face and profile, and we might never be a social media star, but we are called to walk in the footsteps of the one who was a humble servant, who walked the path before us, whose footsteps we are able to walk in, who knows that we will, what we will face as we walk the path that is before us. For he has cleared the way of the obstacles that we might face because he walks with us each and every day. If we go slow, we will be able to walk the way that has been marked for us by the footsteps of Jesus. All we have to do is follow in his steps. And in the following, we will find joy. Amen. As we finish this look and praise of Jesus, I want us to say together one of the creeds of our faith, the ancient creeds of our faith from about 300, um, written by the church, the early church, to describe the Trinity, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The section on Jesus is quite elaborate and I thought it was appropriate as we um, look this, take this look at Jesus from this wonderful hymn of Paul's in Ephesians 2, that we would say this together. So join me as we read this Nicene Creed and remember who, we, who it is that we live for and worship. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, as we have looked at the life of Jesus this morning, this amazing hymn that celebrates the, the life and the humble life, the selfless life of Jesus. We are called to walk in Jesus' footsteps, to have the same mind that Jesus had. Let us consider this morning that humility, that selflessness, that we would share that in our own lives. we think about Jesus and his obedience, obedience to his father's will, obedience that took him to the cross where he, was, where he died for us. May we have the same obe obedience to listen and hear Jesus' voice and follow in the path that he has set before us. we think of his sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us, that he willingly emptied his life, emptied himself of his glory, of his divinity, to become one of us and identify with us so that he could die as one of us and take our sins with him upon the cross, breaking sin's curse once and for all. Oh God, we give thanks for the gift of Jesus, for who he is and what he has done and what he continues to do in our life. Merciful God, we ask that you would give us the same attitude that Jesus had, that we too would be able to empty ourselves and identify with others and be obedient to all that you call us to do and to be, to even the way of the cross, Maybe not to die on the cross, but to die to those things in our life that bear the cross with us. And God, make us eager in all of our life to serve others, to put others before ourselves, to pour out our lives into the lives of others. We are so thankful for Jesus who has walked the path before us whose footsteps we can walk in. Yes, they are big and they're hard to fill, but if we walk slow, if we pray, if we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and strengthen us, we will be able to walk in his footsteps, to have that same mind, that same attitude that Jesus Christ had, and through that, be able to honor Jesus in our life and in all we do. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear these words of blessing. May you pour out your lives 
into the lives of others. And may the humble ways of our Lord Jesus Christ rule our lives. And may we honor him by all that we do and how we do it as we walk in his footsteps each and every day. Amen. Have a blessed week.